solutions to the dropout crisis, addressing the dropout crisis one strategy at a time. Brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center Network with support from K-12 and Fuel Education and in partnership with Clemson Broadcast Productions. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome once again to Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. This is November, and we have a wonderful series of programs coming up, and we're so delighted to have you join us. And I am delighted to see Karen Withington as my co-host again. Hi, Karen. Hi. Gosh, it's good to see you again. Marty, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me as co-host. Yeah, well, you know an awful lot about this <laughs> issue we're going to be talking about today with the what this, the Dropout Prevention Center is doing in the area of rural education and in special areas like Alaska. Yes. And we are about to share with our viewers two programs on Alaska which really spotlights some extraordinary work that's going on up there in our state way up way up north. And so we'll be getting to those the first of those shows today and then in December we'll have another. So here we are um, with that to look forward to today. But before we get started, there's a couple of things that I think the National Dropout Prevention Center wants to share with our viewers. And one, I think, has to do with a very special anniversary, the 30th anniversary. Yes, in October, just last month, the National Dropout Prevention Center and Network celebrated 30 years of being in existence. And uh, throughout those that time, we've been in all states uh, in the nation, except Hawaii, so we still need to get out there, but we've definitely been to Alaska. We <laughs> love, love Alaska. Love Alaska. But we've been, um, you know, helping states all over the nation. And we had our 30th anniversary celebration in October. And uh, for those of you who missed it, you can go on our website homepage and link to some videos of the former staff and dignitaries who were there. And uh, district superintendents sent messages, and there's just lots of uh, good information. Well, I've got to tell you, as someone who got to participate to a degree and certainly enjoyed seeing everybody <laughs> again, what a great day. And I think our viewers will learn a lot about where this center came from. I mean, really, it, it, thinking back on it, it came from hardly anything and mm -hmm. such an extraordinary achievement of so many great people. What a team yes. over the years and continues to be. Mm -hmm. So um, look at that website, dropoutprevention.org. It's right there on the home page and you can pretend that you got to participate because it was live streamed and that was exciting to have everybody there together. Yeah, so, great. And while you're on our website, yes. check out the upcoming conferences okay. and events that we have of in February, February 19th through 22nd, we'll be back at Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. South Carolina for the 2017 At-Risk National Youth Forum. Uh, this year's event is going to be really exciting. We're going to have some uh, famous <laughs> coaches yes. there who yeah. have worked so much with extracurricular, uh, that um, mentoring, relationship type uh, arrangement and relationship between youth and adult uh, mentors is, is a theme for the forum uh, in February. So. Um, we hope everybody will look into that, look at who's going to be there. Please join us there. There are lots of other strands besides the extracurricular relationship yeah. strand. Uh, we'll have juvenile justice and law enforcement and uh, community connections as a strand, uh, school climate. So uh, that is going to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, event in February. It looks good, and I like the focus on realizing that all aspects of a youth's development are important. And so with the coaches involved, they definitely are helping some of the, the most at-risk kids we have. They really yes. are. So Very that's going to be a great figures. one this year. That's going to be great. So we've got lots to look forward to, as always, mm -hmm. with the National Dropout Prevention Center. But today, we have something really special to look forward to as well. And we'd like to kind of bring our guests from Alaska uh, on board here because uh, we'd like you to meet them. And then we're going to um, have them uh, take us through the extraordinary story about what's going on in Alaska. And the center has really been involved with Native issues in a lot of ways. And as we bring in our guests, maybe you can kind of share a little bit with that with us as we meet our two guests. Well, th thank you, Marty. Um, I think today's program uh, hits on two very interesting and very complex arenas in the dropout prevention. Uh, one is there's definitely wonderful, beautiful elements of rural and remote 
life, mm -hmm. but there are also challenges yes. uh, for students, teachers, administrators, and all in those areas. Mm -hmm. So Alaska definitely, you know, has the beautiful remote and rural areas and also the challenges related to that. And uh, the other um, uh, t topic is the uh, Native American and tribal communities. Mm -hmm. The beauty there as well, the culture, um, but also can be very challenging for new teachers coming in mm -hmm. and people who don't know the, the culture and uh, environment as much. So I think today's program focuses on both of those. Uh, National Dropout Prevention Center has been mm -hmm. um, you know, involved in both of those arenas for some time and we have resources related to that. Right. But uh, we love the Alaska stories. They, they bring the two together. They do. And mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of people are going to want to comment on this program. And before we turn it over to them, I'd like to give that address. Because on this website where you see the program, you have a discussion board where you can put comments. And also, there's the tweeting thing. And Karen, I always turn to you for tweeting. <laughs> we have a Facebook page and a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. uh, at NDPCN is the Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, handle yeah. to use to comment about today's program, uh, okay. but use the discussion board as well to specifically um, get a discussion going about okay. this program. Well, now I see some people looking over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got company here, which yes. is what we want. Wonderful. And um, Karen, can you introduce our two guests? Oh, yes, I would love to. Well, I know Kelly Tonsmeyer has been a long time. Uh, Kelly Tonsmeyer is on my right here uh, mm -hmm. on the screen. Um, a longtime friend of the National Dropout Prevention Center Network and attended many conferences. He's with the Alaska Staff. I'm going to let him Alaska tell us. Alaska Staff <laughs> Development Network. <laughs> Staff <laughs> Development, uh, uh, he's the director of oh. that. And uh, Carolyn Heflin, who is in the Bering Strait School District. And Carolyn, uh, maybe I will let you both tell your what you do a little bit. Yeah. So um, we're gonna we're gonna bring Kelly in first, I think, okay. um, to kind of give us an overview of uh, what we're going to hear today, Kelly. So we're going to turn the um, program over to you for the next few minutes to kind of fill us in on what we got to look forward to as we learn about Bering Strait. It's gonna be a great story, everybody. Great story yeah. coming up. Thank you for joining Thank you for us. Morning, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to share some of the exciting work that's occurring in Bering Strait School District with colleagues throughout the nation. This is a great story about a dramatic improvement, not only in four-year high school graduation, but improvement in the entire school system. When we started work, this is now our sixth year of working together, Bering Strait, was among the lowest high school graduation rates in the state. And now they're at the very top of, of the list statewide, which is unheard of for rural, remote Alaska Native School District to, to do so well. So it's, it's a great story. Uh, we think if Bering Strait can, uh, can do this in spite of some of the biggest challenges that my colleague uh, Carolyn Heflin is going to tell you about, uh, anybody can do this. So the Alaska Staff Development Network is in our sixth year of providing training and technical assistance to Bering Strait School District. The team of our consultants have been working together with BSSD for the past five years plus years, both on site and through technology to help build BSSD's capacity in literacy, math, cultural competency, RTI, and improving student behavior. Carolyn Heflin, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction at Bering Strait, has led the charge. I'm so proud of the work that Carolyn and her colleagues have done. I particularly want to thank the U.S. Education Department, Alaska Native Education Grant Program for the two grants that have helped, helped us and have been instrumental in accomplishing this work. It's been my great pleasure to serve as project director for both of these grants. And, but let's hear from, from Carolyn. Uh, 
she's the one on the on the ground get doing all, all the great work so so happy to introduce Carolyn to to your audience well thank you for bringing Carolyn to our attention and Carolyn welcome to solutions uh, particularly uh, because of the incredible work you've done and your team as well the support of uh, the Alaska Staff Development Network and others to achieve these great results I know our, our viewers want to see where you came from and where, where you've gone to have Kelly Tongsmeyer say you've got to have this <laughs> on our program and to be so adamant about it. So um, I turn the, the baton, as it were, over to you, Carolyn, to, to get us started. Uh, sure, thank you for having me today. Um, I want to thank the National Dropout Prevention Center Network for uh, giving me the ability to uh, talk about the wonderful things that the people in our communities and our staff are doing in our school district for our students. So uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I appreciate that. Uh, if we will look at the uh, first slide, please. Is that how I do that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if we'd look at the first slide. Okay. Thank you. If we'd look at the first uh, slide. Oh. I'm going to quit doing that. Okay, uh, Waka, welcome. Uh, this is a picture of Unilakli, Alaska. All of our schools are on the uh, Bering Sea and uh, Western Alaska. So this is a picture of Unilakli, Alaska on the Bering Sea. And uh, this is where our district office is located. Uh, next slide. Our communities are very small and very rural. Uh, as with the next slide, or with this picture, you can see um, this is a picture of Little Diomede Island. And Little Diomede is actually uh, just a few miles away from Siberia. And uh, there's a picture of Big Diomede Island where that's part of Siberia. So we're literally, uh, you can see uh, uh, Siberia from, from our classroom windows in Little Diomede Island. So I'll give you an indication of uh, uh, what rural really means in rural Alaska. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that steep terrain, too. Yeah. Do you have that same terrain uh, on some of your uh, islands? No, no uh, it actually it varies. Every, yeah. uh, every, uh, every village has a different uh, topography. Uh, it's a very unique region, and they're very unique communities. Mm. And a very large district. Uh, uh, acreage wise or square miles. Right, right. Uh, if you'll uh, take a look at the next slide, our school district uh, uh, actually is uh, in western Alaska and what I say it's uh, above a Nome and a little bit below Nome. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Nome, Alaska and some of the reality uh, TV shows. So our uh, school district is in that area in western Alaska. But if you look, I have the uh, my home state of Louisiana uh, highlighted. Uh, our school district has the land mass size of uh, the state of Louisiana. So while we have very few, uh, not as many students as a, a bigger school district, uh, the land size uh, does create some complications. And I think that's a very uh, typical thing of a rural area. I mean, this is not a typical rural area, but it is typical in rural areas, and I think we want our viewers to note that, that there are distances between um, the towns, the villages, communities in a school district. I love that you're from Louisiana. Uh, and you're up there in Alaska and that you identify in a way with your home state because of the size of the district that you are now a leader in. That, that's sort of an interesting kind of connection, I think. Absolutely. We're, well, Bering Strait has been my uh, home for the past 14 years. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I spent most of my childhood in Louisiana, but I've spent most of my adulthood in Alaska. Yeah. So uh, I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> well, okay, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and you found you found your true home. It's yeah. a, yes. Are there similarities, Carolyn? Uh, you know, there are some similarities, uh, especially with the cultures, a uh, respect for the elders. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that uh, very um, comforting, uh, respect for our families 
and uh, there's a lot of, of people that have subsistence here mm -hmm. where in Louisiana they do uh, hunting and fishing and mm -hmm. um, gardening as well. So there are a lot of comparisons. There's more similarities than there are differences. Yeah, and I think that's a theme for this program that although um, most of the people in the other 49 states don't have the topography and the particular location of their rural villages, the commonalities are what was so compelling about your story that although you have these additional challenges and so forth, but they're really the challenges and, and the solutions, as mm -hmm. we're going to talk about, are things we can share in common. And so uh, that's what I love about this story, and that's interesting about Louisiana and Alaska. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking hot and cold, but there's so much more to it than that. Yeah. Okay, so do proceed. Do proceed. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I believe we talked about the next slide with uh, the state. So um, likewise, so in order for us to uh, travel to our schools, we are not on the road system. Uh, you'll hear the phrase road system in Alaska used often. Half of the state is connected by roads where they can travel from one city or town to another. The other half of the state is not connected. So we are not on the road system, which means that every time we want to visit a school, if it's not electronically like you and I are visiting right now, uh, it requires transportation with a, with a plane. Are there any two villages that are connected by a uh, road or every one of them is isolated from the others? Stebbins and St. Michael are connected by road. Um, that's the only one that uh, of the villages that are connected. But when you're used to that interconnectedness mm -hmm. to drive from one town to the other town to the other town, you cannot do that. Now, a lot of our uh, people, a lot of our community members will travel across country mm -hmm. uh, by snow machine or four-wheeler or even boat on the coast if the if the weather is yeah. good. Um, but uh, the primary travel is is by airplane. By airplane. And how fortunate that we have the internet now and in the connections with the Alaska Scap Development Network, for example, and our friend Kelly Tonsmeyer. And how essential that kind of a network is for rural areas mm -hmm. that have um, small populations in their schools and the need is just as great for them to have professional development and not everybody can go driving to the county mm -hmm. seat you know so that's why this is such a great story because your challenges are greater than others <laughs> you don't have roads <laughs> <laughs> okay well i think we're setting the stage for that this is a very unique place let's yeah. keep going we're learning lots so your slide says about 1800 students in 15 schools Yes, we have about 1,800 students in 15 schools, 15 communities. And That's correct. A little more than 100 students per school on average. Uh, no, actually, our smallest school only has 20 students. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I figured there would be a range. Our, our little bit bigger schools have up to 200 students. I think the uh, the most unique part of our schools are that they are all K through 12 schools. Mm -hmm. So it really yeah. creates that community environment from, uh, from K to 12 with staff and teachers, where when you're in larger school systems, you don't get to collaborate as much with your colleagues above or below you mm -hmm. in, in teaching grades. So that's a really uh, great thing that we have the privilege to, to do. That is a benefit. special thing, mm -hmm. you know, a real community school. Uh, you think about the one-room schoolhouse in a lot of way with the older students helping the younger students and all kinds of maybe non-graded things. It, it's just a, be an exciting yeah. environment to work in, I think. Oh, in my. larger schools, it's yeah. really difficult to make uh, the connection between yeah. the different grade levels. Yeah. So this is, yeah, relationships must be very strong in these schools. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's important. Okay, ah, this is great. What's next? Sure. Uh, the next thing uh, on the next slide, uh, that's our uh, the Barron Strait School District's um, educational mission. And uh, there's one thing that's really important. It's an environment that reflects our 
um, children's heritage. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in our school district is we have three different Alaska Native populations primarily. And uh, it's Siberian Yupik, Yupik, and Inupiaq. So what we want to do is make sure that it's not uh, what is coined the frame, just a cord, coined the frame phrase, just a Western uh, education. Mm-hmm. Which we engage our students through their culture, cultural heritage to make those connections. So that's a very important part of our mission. Okay. Um, where we started at, if you'll look at the next slide, mm-hmm. all of our um, stakeholders, uh, community members, district office staff, uh, especially our school board, uh, was very inter- instrumental in, do- in talking and starting discussions at looking at our graduation rates. We weren't meeting the needs of our students as a school district, and we were not serving our communities like we should as a school district. So we had some conversations. Uh, there was a lot of stakeholders involved, and what should be done to improve the graduation rate. And while we were having these discussions, if you'll look at the next slide. While we were having these discussions, these are the, the facts and the statistics that our educators deal with on a daily basis. Uh, because of our rural location, when we had uh, that year a uh, 35% teacher turnover, um, and that it could be higher in some schools. Uh, you know, it, it may have been every teacher except for one or two teachers left that year. Uh, Half, about 48% of our teachers had less than two years of experience as well. So that means we did not have a lot of veteran edu- educators, teachers at the time. Mm-hmm. Also, if you look at, there's uh, similarities that I was talking about. Um, if you look at the poverty rate uh, among Alaska Natives, it's twice as high as the U.S. average. So I think a lot of educators out there are working with communities that have high poverty rates and have those factors uh, come into their school every day because students cannot leave those characteristics behind. Um, So that's something that we all work with our students on a daily basis is to uh, break that poverty cycle and that's not an easy thing to do. I was getting ready to say, Carolyn, we would call these risk factors, and uh, all but a couple of them would apply to every student in the school because they're community factors and school school building factors, not the individual students, but they impact on um, all the students. So these are real, really big challenges. I think one of the best uh, best traits of the of the teachers and the staff in our district is they know they're not just reading, writing, math, science, social studies teachers. They know that there are outside things um, that affect students and that they need to deal with on a daily basis and build those relationships with students. And that's, I believe that's why I've been in this district the past 14 years, is because of those relationships and because uh, we care for the students and we want to make sure that they succeed and become productive community members. Those are the protective factors, so. <laughs> yeah, that's I great. think that's where we're moving. Mm-hmm. We're moving toward that. But um, there's quite a lot of challenges there that um, you all have come to grips with in, in a very uh, powerful way, mm-hmm. I would say, when mm-hmm. we get to that part of the story. So what, what's the next part of our story here? Sure. Uh, while we know we have those challenges, uh, there's some uh, just for audience misconceptions. Mm-hmm. Um, our kids are just like regular teenagers, uh, but uh, they've, uh, as evidenced by this slide, um, they they go on national trips mm-hmm. and they advocate for their culture and they advocate for their environment and. Um, as we look at the uh, next slide, they participate in um, in science fairs, uh, in athletics. They are uh, love basketball, and uh, we're just uh, these these students have a lot of creativity. 
a lot of uh, intelligence, a lot of resiliency. And that's where we're really excited to work with them and to create a system to help uh, increase graduation rates and decrease uh, dropouts. Well, I love to see the, the, the youth engagement and the kinds of things that you might not expect mm -hmm. to be coming from Alaska. And the fact that they do get to travel and see other places, but also share a culture that they mm -hmm. are valuing is good for those who meet them. Mm -hmm. And then that validates that part of their life as well. They have so, a very important vo voice. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so um, this, is, this is great stuff to see. And I just do love the idea of this small community and how caring and um, relationships are probably what are making this res resilience you're talking about so effective because you have that kind of environment. Would that all schools could create that kind of a school climate? Mm -hmm. I think we would see a lot better everywhere, urban mm -hmm. or rural or suburban anywhere in between. And so that's something that's part of your culture that you can share with our viewers that has obviously, as used as you will be sharing with us what you've done to kind of use that to facilitate um, a solution. So right. yeah, you, that concept I think is important, that what you have is such a strength and, and such right. a strength, yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so what we decided to do based on our graduation results um, mm -hmm. of the past few uh, years that I showed uh, yeah. previously is uh, if you'll look at the uh, next slide is that the uh, Bering Strait School District uh, applied for a, a U.S. Department of Education Alaska Native Education Program grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we did is we called this grant the Graduation and Academic Improvement for Native Students Grant, or the GAINS Grant. And it's uh, it was an incredible partnership. It was between Bering Strait School District, uh, QUERIC, and the Alaska State Development Network. And um, so uh, we uh, created goals, or three objectives, three primary objectives to work on. And if you'll look at the uh, next slide, there we go. Um, three objectives. One was to have early identification, to develop a system where all the data was collected together to identify students that were at risk at dropping out. The second objective had to do with uh, providing services, academic, social, and health services to students once we identified them at risk, what do we do then? So that was to, uh, to, to have those services for those students. And the third objective, it was to actually improve the instruction and the leadership with the staff and provide them professional development with these students that are at risk at dropping out. You know what I like about this, um, and it refers back to last month's program, Karen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, Kara, Carolyn and Kelly, but Sandy Addis was here to share what they do at the Diploma Planning Institute, and we have a nice 20-minute segment of Sandy talking about the foundational strategy, uh, and you, that's exactly what you did. Some people don't even know who their at-risk kids are in bigger schools and they don't know what the things are that make them at risk because they just guess or whatever. And then because they've done that, they don't know what to actually do. But here, what you've done, and I can see what you've identified, the needs of the students and the needs of the faculty because mm -hmm. you you absolutely dealt with student needs in objective two. And then I see objective three with that teacher turnover, young teachers need, addressing that need. So I think uh, this is, if, mm -hmm. if you haven't seen October's program viewers, go back and have a look because they are doing what the National Dropout Prevention Center has advocated with their 15 effective strategies, mm -hmm. but start with the foundations. Right. And oh, you are a case study <laughs> of how it works. Beautiful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love this. And you know, Solutions is a place for all of us to learn, including yours truly. And I just found last month's really interesting because we've been doing strategies for years, but to see it all put together like that, and now to have you come right away and say, this is what we did, and we started how many years ago? <laughs> when you got, you got yeah. the grant. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. How many years has it been, Carolyn? Five or six years? Yes. Ah, six years. There you are. Yeah. See? Turning mm -hmm. the world around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, started with the foundation. I just That's had to great. I had to put that in. So anybody who missed that program, it's archived on this website. Mm -hmm. On this website, dropoffprevention.org solutions October program. And and now November's is is a perfect next stroke. So there we go. Sorry for the commercial break, but it's actually reinforcing <laughs> what you're doing. I hope you can see that. Well, the systemic oh, approach. Yes. Is yes. Yeah. A systemic approach. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. So those are great Absolutely. objectives. Sure. So uh, to go into the systemic approach, if you'll uh, take mm -hmm. a look at the next slide, okay. the objective. So what we started with creating was an early warning system. This is, was a computer program system where it compiled the data that the uh, district uh, determined were some data that created students that were at risk, that indicated students would be at risk. Uh, for instance, if a student's behind in reading, if the student's behind in math, if the student's having uh, not so good attendance, or if the, uh, the student is having behavior problems in the classroom, or uh, discipline referrals to the office. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so many of our teachers and so many uh, school districts have data, they have great data, but it takes time to pull all that data together um, before you even get a chance to look at it. So this is really a time saver where it pulled all the data for us automatically, mm -hmm. and uh, it really it really helped us out to identify students very quickly. Instead of pulling reports, and we were able just to look at the students automatically. Yeah, technology, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. <laughs> yes, uh, so if you look at the next slide, um, this is mm -hmm. what is, uh, our DUA system looks like. Uh, it had a ability to identify attendance. As you could see, there were some students there that were identified with uh, low attendance, um, high suspensions, um, also uh, having difficulties in, in math and reading. So that let us know uh, some information on how to identify those students. The system did that automatically. Uh, one of the best parts of the system is it created a, a flag warning system where um, first flag was just to watch um, where staff, you know, students don't normally uh, drop out all of a sudden there if there's warning signs and there's things that you that educators see that administrators see along the road that leads to that point of I'm not coming back to school. So what this system did was if it one thing came up that was agreed upon a data point that was an early warning indicator, uh, it would literally a flag would pop up on the system just to keep the student on the radar. Mm -hmm. So the teacher, so the administrator could talk to the student. Um, maybe the student was struggling in math, so that so the student could get some additional help, so they wouldn't be so frustrated. Um, so it re really worked on prevention. Um, this this system really helped us with prevention um, to see the small signs first. A lot of time, educators feel like firemen, where they're putting out the big fires first, and this this let us be a lot more preventative in in our instruction in our relationships with students. And, um, Carolyn, I'm thinking that you have maybe different levels of uh, where a flag would um, click in depending on the grade level. Uh, you have a little bit different depending on the grade level? No, uh, there was actually when you have a system, when you're looking at the data that you want to use as a school district, you have to set that threshold at what point do you decide that's a flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for instance, uh, in high school, it might be a student uh, midterm grade is uh, a D. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a flag uh, to prevent them from going even lower. Right. So that might flag up for that student. Um, so there's different parameters. You are right that there's different parameters set for different grade levels. Um, 
um, elementary would be a little different from high school, but it just you just adjust the parameters and mm -hmm. what you think your school district thinks is best for the students. And then you need to know a little bit about how to interpret it as well. I'm thinking about attendance, for example, at the elementary level, maybe more related to transportation issues. Well, I, that could be at e e any level, but you might have to look at what's behind the, the flag as well. And what's causing right. the problem. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and leading into that, um, actually, um, if you take a look at the next objective, objective two, where we provide the academic, social, and health services for those students. Uh, that is where we actually, okay, so we have the data, we have the threshold, that student is at risk, now what do we do with the student? How do we help the student? So this part, this objective was key in how do we help the student? So if you'll take a look at the next slide, these were some of the things that we uh, decided to do. I was thinking as you and Karen were having the discussion about the, uh, these identification, that for individual students you can see some red flags, but you surely must see some patterns um, so you can do a systemic approach, not just for an individual child, but you've got, uh, let's say, children in the elementary school are all struggling with math. And so obviously we need to deal with, that goes to the third objective, uh, professional development to work with teachers then. So, uh, the, and that would be the same thing, not just in the academic areas, but also in the social areas where you see lots of red flags for lots of kids, not just the isolated one or two. So it's, it's a great system for identifying not just individuals, but system, mm -hmm. systemic problems within okay. Yeah, and I think that needs to be pointed out because these early warning systems reveal things you had no idea were going on because there's so many things going on in a school mm -hmm. and this pops them right out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these uh, academic ser services that I referenced that were uh, once you identify students, um, it can be uh, systematic for whole group. However, it can benefit individual students. So for one uh, instance is we offered af academic tutoring, after school mm -hmm. tutoring, for any student that would like to have after school tutoring. And it takes a lot of teamwork. You're uh, not just um, as a student, as a high school student in particular, you weren't just going in after school tutoring to practice on a skill or on a focus. Uh, it was targeted. Uh, for instance, if that student was having difficulties with the day before his math assignment, they were had that opportunity to receive that additional help. So often um, our high school students become frustrated in the core subjects and they don't feel like they have that support. And uh, this, this opportunity gives them an opportunity to get that support more in a private setting uh, mm -hmm. instead of a classroom setting. Because as we all know, as our students become older, they're, little, they're always more self-conscious. It seems like the older they get. Yeah. So um, it, really, it really helped our students. Um, the second thing we did is we had a summer school that uh, worked um, incredibly hard on intensive uh, credit recovery. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, you know, if you have a ninth grader that had an awful year in school and didn't receive many credits at all, what hope is there that they're going to graduate on time with their friends mm -hmm if they do not receive any uh, extra academic credit recovery. So uh, it's, it's like uh, if I'm a freshman and I don't do well in class and I uh, you know, only have two or three credits and I'm missing four or five, what am I going to do? So um, I might as well drop out, I'm yeah. behind. Okay. So uh, that's really important with our summer school programs that's, is to catch that's a, that's a huge, a huge one because I think so many, so many are lost in ninth grade for that very reason. Um, and I, I can never catch up. And so, like you say, they quit. But ninth grade, that's a transitional year. It's difficult all over the country. 
but to immediately stop that because retention is a terrible option in, for these children. They want to be with their age mates, their peers, and so you have got to step in and intervene and make that happen. So I would wager, Karen, if you want to wager on this, <laughs> I, I sometimes go up to 25 cents on my bets. <laughs> <laughs> Not a big That's better, my kind of but yeah, right. <laughs> but that that you have probably saved a good many of your dropouts with that uh, particular Absolutely. approach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I've had a lot of individual teachers email me and say, or their or counselors at school and say, uh, we have academic advising forms that every junior and senior. Uh, complete with their uh, parents mm -hmm. and um, it tracks where the students are and I've had a lot of teachers a lot of counselors principals contact me and say what can we do about credit recovery um, and we've come up with some creative ways whether it was summer school uh, whether it was work programs uh, during the summer um, and that'll lead to the next um, uh, academic service was creative high school electives. Uh, if students do not feel like the core contents are related to their life, and um, that happens more uh, w with the culture and the communities we, um, we service uh, with that Western education, uh, we try our best to in integrate uh, cultural uh, relevancy into reading, writing, and math, and we're starting to do that. Uh, however, with high school students, we wanted to have that creative high school electives where it was things that were relevant um, after they graduate, how would they become a productive community member? And so we did things like outdoor safety and survival, uh, parenting skills, subsistence, leadership, self-management. So we, we uh, had a lot of creative high school electives that uh, they just are better people for taking the courses mm -hmm. and for learning that information. And um, so often our high school students get a piece of paper and they say, now what? And they, uh, they may not feel like they make that connection after they graduate. Uh, we also uh, focused on relevant high school electives, focusing on career paths. For instance, uh, teaching profession, elder care, early childhood education, building maintenance, work study, independent study. So we gave students the opportunity to look at careers they may be interested in and get some of that experience in high school. And, uh, you know, we, I had some good conversations when I was principal at the time with students. They said, oh, I, I can't, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. I said, well, at least you haven't gone to college and spent $5,000 that <laughs> semester yeah. to decide you don't want to do this. So we would change electives, but then we would talk about work skills. Okay, everyone at one point in their life has taken a job that they weren't happy with and might would have had to leave. So how do you handle those skills um, professionally until it's, it's time to move on? So there was a lot of teachable moments with these electives um, that really were valuable to students. Uh, and another thing we did was uh, dual credit high school courses. So our district, our school district pays for college classes for our juniors and seniors right now. And we have our schedules built in to our high schools where we work with uh, Northwest Campus and Nome to provide uh, classes to our students who are interested. And as we all know, when I was talking about earlier about breaking the poverty cycle, is you cannot, um, one of the hardest things is if no one in your home has ever gone to college, um, you don't have those skills, you don't have that background. So why not get those skills while you're still in high school with your high school teacher to support you? Mm -hmm. And you have an instructor from this region to support you. So uh, we, for instance, semester two, we're focusing on two um, industries that are in the communities that are the biggest job employers. 
One is tribal government and one is education. So we're offering two dual credit courses, uh, semester two, to our high school students where they can take a look at the two biggest uh, money-making uh, positions uh, available in their community and see if they like that and, and take those courses and they can continue with that tract if they like it. If not, then they know that they may have to go outside more to get a different kind of um, career. So that's something that it's just all about exploring. Um, and then uh, we also have college and career trips for our juniors and seniors. Uh, NSEDC, which is Norton Sound Economic Development Commission, gives us $100,000 each year. And we have the ability to take our juniors and seniors to colleges. We help them register. We help them uh, get their dorm rooms. We help them get their uh, lunch cards, all that kind of stuff. And then for our students that are interested in the vocational track, we look at all the vocational tracks around the state. And these, and these students get to leave their schools and their communities and travel and see what's out there if, if it's a choice they want to make to go or if it's a choice they want to stay at home and continue long distance. So we offer every opportunity imaginable where um, it's possible and we build students up to believe that. Wow. And, and, and all the students at all the schools have these opportunities. Yes. There you go. Mm -hmm. It can be done. It mm -hmm. can be done. Mm -hmm. oh, this is so great. Uh, what's this other section you have here, um, social and health services? Sure, uh, absolutely. We have a wonderful counseling program where they have academic advising with our high school students, uh, where it talks about credits, how many credits you have, how many credits you need. Uh, the parents are aware of that, so they can help support the student as well. Um, our counselors provide post-secondary assistance, uh, college application, how do you fill it out, let's fill it out together, FAFSA, uh, get your parents' stuff, we'll help you fill it out, um, and then also social-emotional uh, learning assistance where students are struggling on, on daily life uh, basis problems and just working with them and building those relationships and letting them know they have someone that they can talk to. Well, this is very comprehensive, and I want to guess to get have time to get to objective three mm -hmm. and also the results. So let's move on, um, and I'm going to stop interrupting. Oh. <laughs> I promise, oh. because you have so much information to share, and um, I think it's really important that we get it all in during and our time period. And we probably should say, use that discussion board, because we can probably, yeah. Carol, and I'm sure you'd be available to answer questions later, you know. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So that, that's important. Absolutely. Okay. That's, so objective three was this professional development. Sure. Uh, objective three had to do with professional development for our uh, teachers. One thing we did is we uh, created uh, a solutions team. So basically that's a building instructional team that would meet on a regular basis to look at the student data. They would look at do us. They, uh, they would look at early uh, or dropout prevention software program. They would look at everything imaginable and they would see if systemically was it a school problem that or a school challenge that they needed to work with as a staff or was it more individual students and do they need to work with those individual students more and it creates that collaboration uh, between uh, teachers um, where uh, everyone knew that little Johnny wasn't coming to school uh, and was coming to school late. So uh, maybe the school administrator asked the school janitor to knock on little Johnny's door every morning and see if he wanted to ride to school in the morning. And yeah, sure, so Johnny started coming to school. So there was all sorts of, of problem solving skills, creativity that could be used in that that was really beneficial. Also, uh, our district office gave our schools an additional hour of uh, per week without students. 
So what we called it is an early out. So it actually gave staffs time to meet. It gave uh, staff t staffs time to meet and collaborate. And teachers just don't feel like they have enough time. So um, they were. I was really fortunate uh, that I was part of the school at the time that was given that additional hour each week. And it went by very quick and it was very needed. Uh, the last thing that we did uh, uh, that the district office did is to target professional development um, based on patterns of data. So that's where the district office, you have your school system uh, within your individual school, but then you have your district system as a whole. So where are the schools struggling with in their data and supporting them with that assistance? Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all it's all ties together. Right, and then uh, professional development. Uh, we looked at adopting. We adopted uh, Champs, which is our class uh, class wide behavior behavior uh, positive behavior support, mm -hmm. and it's from Safe Civil mm -hmm. Schools. Okay. And um, here's an important key too. We created a, a Champs instructional liaison. So there was a point person at the school mm -hmm. besides administrator. So it was a coach, someone that could work with teachers that needed assistance on a coaching level and uh, not on the administrative level. And uh, so there's been huge efforts made on that um, to help assist teachers in, in, in that area as well. Well, I'm eager to share with the viewers the next slide because after all these years of work, you've got, well, you started right away getting results, but shall we share it now? Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so oh. remember, in physical year 10, uh, it was 48%, uh -huh. and it had been, it had been stagnant. Yeah. And, uh, and today we are at 79%. Yeah. And um, there's a statistic I didn't put in there that I'm even more happy with. Uh, there, this is four-year cohorts, which mm -hmm. is uh, over four years. Our five-year cohort for FY16 was 80%. Mm -hmm. so while we may not have caught every student, we caught a majority of them at least their fifth year. Yeah. And um, that says a lot as That's well. So mm -hmm. we have students that aren't just uh, maybe they need a little more time, but they're coming back their fifth year, and we encourage that, and we welcome them back and make it a, a supportive environment with them. So uh, we were 3% above the state average uh, for FY16, and um, it's like uh, Mr. Tonsmeyer talked about, for Alaska Native population, that's just unheard of. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's really with some of the uh, statistics and facts we deal with on a daily basis. Oh, um, it's quite an accomplishment. Very proud of everybody. We <laughs> told you it was a great story. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have one quick question um, that it would be curious to see at some point, the data on the teachers um, and whether people are staying mm -hmm. longer now that you've made these changes and feeling more confident about staying in the profession and, and staying in these wonderful community schools. Are you seeing changes there as well? You know, we actually, you know, I don't have the data in front of me. Yeah. Um, that is a challenge mm -hmm. um, for our school district still. Um, people have to leave their families uh, way far behind and come to a um. completely different environment. And we, we're we working on building our teachers from within and growing our own teachers mm -hmm. and our own community members. Um, and that's what, where we're focusing a lot of our efforts on right now. Um, and we've received a grant to do this is to uh, build a professional capacity from within the community. Um, because that's interesting. That's, that's, that's interesting. No, it is probably the, the way to do it. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and these young people who are graduating, they may want to come back because it's such a great place to live and, and a great place to work. It looks like it. Absolutely. it. absolutely. We're going to have to move quickly now. I know you've got some wonderful quotes coming up. You want to share some of those with us before we bring Kelly back on? Sure. Uh, I just want to share this, uh, this uh, next one. Um, I think this really defined uh, the way our district works. 
that it's achieved by developing our strengths, not mm -hmm. eliminating our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with systems development, um, school districts and educators look at what's not going well. And I think it's important to look at what's going well and integrate more things into that system versus rebuilding everything. In education, we have a tendency to throw mm -hmm. things out every few years <laughs> yes. and not, and, and start all over again. Uh, so I think one thing that really helped us with time and efficiency and effectiveness was to look at what was going well and assimilate continued things into that system versus throwing everything away and starting from scratch. If I can skip a couple more. Yeah, let's skip to There's your... one that reminds me oh, of Did you have one you liked? Well, the systemic... Uh, Where'd it go? Where'd it go? The green... Well, there it is. Yep. Okay. This is a, the systemic. It's kind of like measure twice, cut once. You want to do the analysis of the data uh, make sure you know what your problems are and what you want to solve before you get the solution. Right. Right, right. And with, and with the systems, uh, also educators, we're action-oriented. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're on yeah. our feet. We're working with kids 24-7. We're doing this. We're doing that for our students. So it's, it's really uh, difficult sometimes for us to sit back and take that time to plan and plan effectively. Right. And it's not overnight and you feel that mounting pressure that you need to do something now, but if you don't roll it out with as many, uh, with as organized as you want it to, it won't work very well. And then people will feel defeated uh, when they're trying to do it. And then they lose faith and confidence and and especially the district office's ability to to do something. Um, so that implementation is really important with systemic approach. Well, I think um, we want to just put that last slide up with, um, with Carolyn's contact information for people to kind of see. But of course, there is the discussion board. But Callie Tongsmeyer, we're bringing you back in. Aren't you proud of Carolyn and, and the wonderful work that she's done? We are just so impressed and appreciate you're bringing her here. Do you have some final thoughts? Uh, I sure do. What a great <laughs> story, Carolyn, of turnaround leadership. Uh, great job of summarizing the, the poverty, the cultural differences, the unbelievably challenging high teacher turnover, the preponderance of beginning and early career teachers, in spite of all of that, to be able to move the high school graduation rate from 32 percent to as high as 83 percent is just phenomenal and, and un, unheard of it in Alaska or any other native communities I know of throughout the United States. We, we spent a lot of time trying to build capacity. We didn't have time to go into all, all of this, particularly Objective 3, but we worked very hard to build the capacity of the central office staff, principals and teachers, and BSSDs becoming a lot less dependent on our Alaska Staff Development Network consultants because they, they own this work and they've developed the expertise to address it. I really like the way that they use continuing and uh, career technical education. The whole community leadership piece is so critical, particularly for kids who want to stay in the community and their learning skills that can help them to be successful and really contribute within their local communities, uh, career pathways, the dual credit just add so much to kids. Uh, education, the time for collaboration was so critical. If we're going to do all these things, we've got to give the staff at the school site time to collaborate and work together. Certainly, uh, Carolyn de demonstrated how all this work was data driven from the early warning system to the professional development that was provided in literacy, math, RTI, and behavior. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort working on those four big areas, both on site, through distance learning, through webinars with national experts. And this kind of leads us into the next program where we at the Alaska Staff Development Network and the Alaska Council of School Administrators have built on this work in Bering Strait School District and we're replicating it in another even larger school district, Lower Kuskokwim, with 27 school sites and 23 isolated Alaska Native remote villages and we're going to tell their story uh, in the December program and uh, Dan Walker, their superintendent, is going to be, be back with us and it's another great story. It's different in a lot of ways and similar in a lot of ways and uh, something we're just thrilled to have a chance to share with you. So, uh, thank you to uh, National Dropout Prevention Center Network for inviting us to share share some of our work here in Alaska with our colleagues and friends throughout the United States. Well, we thank you for bringing this story and the next one coming to us, Karen. This has been, Carolyn, you all have done a mm -hmm. phenomenal job in your district and I know will continue to. And of course, Kelly, don't ever underestimate what the Alaska Staff Development Network does for that state uh, and has to because of its geographical challenges. It's extraordinary work, and Kelly, I've known you for a long time and have always been impressed with your work. And Carolyn, oh my gosh, you've just made it all happen. So thank you for sharing with us and joining us today. This has been a technological achievement, yes. <laughs> and uh, Karen, we had a good time. I this hope you'll join great. me next time. You or someone from the center mm -hmm. will be here with us next time as we look at this again. But now it's time to um, say farewell to our viewers and thank them for joining us today. So thank you everybody for being with us today. And as you now know, you're gonna to get to find out more about Alaska and its challenges in December's issue of Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. Thanks for joining us. Yeah.